Mexico. And at the end of our last lecture, we were going over a problem and where you were asked to draw a logical circuit, right, analogous, right, to this function f, which is a function of these propositions here. Right. And so here, um, how many of you got to the end and were able to draw a logical circuit, right, that you believe is correct? Right. So, oops. One moment here with our technical difficulties. All right. And so, um, once you came up with a Boolean uh, equation, right, using our sum of products form, that is identifying each of the rows where F was to be true, identifying the combinations of truth values for the corresponding constituent propositions, right, you can come up with an equation very much like this. Again, intuitively, we have a sum of products, right, where we have the Boolean product is analogous to a logical conjunction, and the Boolean addition is analogous to the logical disjunction. Right, so we get a sum of four products, right, because we have four rows that are true in the truth table. Right. We can draw right, a logic circuit analogous to this Boolean equation right, as a disjunction of four different conjunctions. Right. Thus, we have logical and with three arguments here, right, x, y, and z. Right. This corresponds to x times y times z, right, x and y and z. Right. Similarly, right, using this shorthand notation, that is, it's common if you have an inverter, right, followed by a gate, right, simply drawing a circle to indicate that there is an inverter preceding that input, right, is a common shorthand notation for logic circuits. Right. I've used that shorthand in my circuit diagram here. Feel free to do the same in yours. Right. So this is not x and y and not z corresponding to the third term. Right. Similarly, we have uh, terms here as well. Right. So each of the four terms. Note that we can have a logical AND gate with an arbitrary number of inputs. Right. Note that the logical AND operator right, is a binary operator. So for example, if we had x and y, right, we have two operands here. Right. But note that if we have a conjunction of three, right, we can see this as performing an AND with x and y. Right, and then performing a, an and of the result of that, right, with z. Right. However, given the associativity and community properties of our logical and operator that we learned about, right, does the order of these operands matter? Right. Does it matter which of these logical ands we do first? Right. So it's all the same, right? Thus, it's common to simply write a shorthand notation and have a logical and with an arbitrary number of inputs if you just have a conjunction of an arbitrary number of propositions. Right. The logical result will be the same, irrelevant of the order in which you do the binary logical and operation and how you apply it. Yes? So when you write a logical gate, does it have to be in order of the equation, the equation? Like when you draw the circuit, I'm trying to add. When you draw the circuit, it doesn't have to be in order. So you just draw the one right. right, yeah, the commutative property of disjunction, right? No matter which order, we have these Right, if I were to switch the order of each of these terms, the logical result would be the same. Right, similarly, if I were to move one of these disjunctions or conjunction or one of the conjunctions up or down, it doesn't change like, the order. Right, good questions. Any other questions? All right. All right. So now we're going to move on to the next topic. Again, we're moving on to predicate logic. Right, this is a different logical framework, really an extension of propositional logic, right? Uh, predicate logic is simply, right, propositional logic where the subject of a proposition has been parameterized. And one of the main reasons for this is allows us to quantify the subject of a proposition with respect to a collection of potential subjects, right, or a domain. Right, so why would we want the ability to do this? Well, let's look at the following scenario. Right, let's consider a statement where a subject is quantified with respect to some state or, or some set, excuse me, of uh, objects. And so suppose we know every computer connected to the university network is functioning properly. Right, so this is a logical statement. Right? 
it is true or false. Note here that the subject of this statement, right, is a computer which has been quantified, that is every computer. Right? So we're saying every computer. In order to understand what that means, every computer, we need to know, well, what are the possible number of computers? So this is every computer out of the set of possible computers. Right? Trying to translate this English to some meaning. Right? Just using our standard propositional framework, we don't have the ability to reason right, or deduce the truth of the following statement, which, which seemingly we should be able to do. Right? That is, computer number one right, is functioning properly. Right? So for example, if we accept that every computer is functioning properly, right, we cannot reason and determine the truth of computer one is function, functioning properly just using propositional logic because we don't have a way to go from the general right, a quantified right, uh, or relative uh, determination, uh, the relative truth of a statement of a particular subject with respect to its domain or with respect to a set or collection of subjects. Right? And so thus we have motivated predicate logic. Right? So let's consider the following statement, all humans are tall. Right? Within this, let's, draw, let's make a few propositions or a few logical statements uh, in pre propositional logic and then look at it in predicate logic. All right, so propositional logic, let's say we define some proposition P to be that Bob is tall. Right. right, note here that this proposition, and if you look at any of our propositions, right, this is a statement that is either true or false. This is our assumption in propositional logic. Right. You can often also identify various entities or subjects of a proposition and a predicate. Right. So we can split up this proposition into at least two parts where we have a subject or some entities, some subjects, and some predicate. The predicate usually relates our subject right, to something or describes our subject in some way in such a way that we can determine the result to be true or false. Right. Predicate logic right, would formulate the same statement as follows. Right. We would say that P of X, right, which is a predicate function, is the statement that X is tall. Thus, we parameterize right, the predicate right, is tall, right, where the subject X has been parameterized. Note, in order to do this, we need to list out right, the domain or all possible values of X. Right here, we'll say that X can be any human. Right? So X would be some human here. So thus, if we wanted to say that Bob was tall, right, we can say, simply say that P of Bob, right, which is logically equivalent to right, Bob is tall. And sorry for switching the colon to right, the trip bar notation. I'll stay consistent. Right. Right, any questions about that? And again, all we've done is parameterized Right, the subject of our of our statement. Right, one thing to note <clears throat> that once we instantiate the value of x, once we identify a value of x, right, this predicate right becomes a proposition. Once we have identified x to Bob, once we make a statement like this, say x to Bob, right, it now is a proposition and it has a truth value that is known. Right, similarly, a good example from Rosen. Right, so let's say we have a statement x is greater than three. The first part of this, right, is a variable. It is a parameter. It is the subject of our statement. Right, the second part is the predicate, right? It relates our subject, right, to some concept, right? The result of which is either true or false, right? So this refers to the property that the subject, right, um, is greater than three. Right, we can denote this statement, right, using our shorthand notation here, right, where we define P as our predicate being is greater than three. Right, X is our parameter or our variable, the subject of our predicate. Right, the statement P of X is also said to be the value of the proposition of function P at X, right, just other nomenclature. Right, but importantly, note that once right, a value has been assigned to the variable X, the statement P of X becomes a proposition at that point. Right, we, fixed, we fixed the subject, right, it now has a truth value. Any questions about that? Yeah. Does that mean Bob is tall? 
right? So here, again, just to identify these items, right? This is our predicate function. Right. This is our subject, right? And this is our predicate. Right. X is a, a free parameter, right? Until we give it a value, right? So X, if we just write it in a parametric form, P of X, right? Uh, it's simply a, a mapping from our domain of possible X's, right? To this predicate statement. Right. If we assign a value for x, right, then we have a corresponding proposition. Right. Right. It now becomes, we've instantiated our parameter. It is now simply a statement, right, Bob is called, which is either true or false. Right. Right. Again, this framework has a, a couple of benefits. Uh, the first one is it allows us to quantify the truth of statements across a domain of possible subjects, right? It also allows us to relate similar subjects across multiple propositions or multiple predicates. Right. Within this context, we'll now define a quantifier. Right. There are a few standard quantifiers used in mathematics. In English, we have a number as well. Um, in order to quantify a subject, of a predicate, we need to quantify it relative to its domain. So we always need to define the domain, right? The domain of the predicate function is simply the collection or set of all possible subjects, right? We'll more formally define the idea of a domain later on in the course and the idea of a set later on in the course. And for now, we can think of it simply as a collection of all the possible subjects that are valid. Right, so using quantifiers and predicate functions, we can now express the extent to which a predicate is true, right, across the domain subjects. All right, there are three standard quantifiers. I'll go ahead and draw them out now. Their name, right, their denotation or symbols. Right, and then their meaning. All right, so we have a universal quantifier. Right, we have an existential quantifier. Right, and we have a uniqueness quantifier. All right, the symbol for the universal quantifier is an upside down A. Right. If you want to quantify a variable, it's a good idea to denote the variable, so and we would denote it like so for all x, p of x. Right, so if a predicate function right is defined and it's uh, we we've called it p of x, right? We read this as for all x p of x, right? Meaning that for all values of x within the domain of this predicate function, p of x is true. The existential quantifier is a backwards E. Again, we denote which variable is being quantified, as there may be more than one in our logical expression. Right, this is read, there exists an X such that P of X. Right, what does this mean semantically? There exists an X in the domain for which P of X is true. So at least one, right? This is true for at least one of the items in the domain. Right, the uniqueness quantifier. And this is often written as a backward E with a bang symbol or an exclamation mark. Right, there exists a unique X such that P of X, what does that mean? That means there's exactly one X in the domain where P of X is true. Mm -hmm. 
right? The universal quantifier as existential quantifier, right? And uniqueness quantifier. We're going to investigate the universal and as existential quantifiers in some depth through this course, right? The uniqueness quantifier is not used quite as much, right? So we won't do very many examples concerning the uniqueness quantifier. So let's see a few, a few examples where we might use these symbols. And so this will be example 114. In this example, let's say that we have a domain, right, which consists of three items. So this will be a simple example, right? So here we just have a collection of three integers, negative one, two, and negative four, right? So our little curly brace, braces here just mean we have a collection of three items, right? They're comma separated. Right, let's define our functions. Let's have two functions on this domain. Let's say we have uh, p of x right, is defined to be right, x is less than 3. And let's define another predicate q of x, which is the absolute value of x is less than 3. All right, so let's look at our newly learned quantifiers. Right, and determine the truth right, of the following statements. Right. So how about right, for all x, p of x? Right. Is this true or false? Right. You guys say false. Why is that the case? Right, uh, so p of x is x is less than three, right? However, right, well, p of x, right? So p of x is just x. So for all x, uh, p of x, what do you guys think, true or false? True. Right, so for each of the values, each of the x's in our domain, right, this statement is true. So it's true for negative one and true for negative for two and true for negative four. It's, well, if it was true for, for all x, is it true for at least one x? Right, so there exists an x where p of x is true. That's going to be true. Right, what about there exists a unique x for p of x? Okay, that's false, right? Because uniqueness quantifier says that there exists only one solution. Right? However, there are multiple. And so this is false. Oops. All right, let's look at q of x. So again, let's do for all x, q of x. Right, the absolute value right, of minus 4, as we noted before, right, is not going to be less than 3. Right, so for all x, q of x is going to be false. Right, does there exist a solution for q of x? Sure. And so this is true. Right, is there a unique solution for q of x? What was that? False, right? Because there, a, there are two solutions. Right? So not exactly one. So false. Thank you. All right. So note that, and we sort of went through this, and I said it in English, but we didn't write it out formally. Right? These quantifiers can be and can be logically expressed as conjunctions, right, of individual predicates across all the items in a domain, right? So, for example, we can write out, right, for all x, let's change the color here. And thus, right, let's assume x can take on n different values. All right, so here we're just saying the domain of x has n different options. And the last one we had three. In, in this particular case, we'll just make it generic. We'll say that there's n different options. All right, let's say that we enumerate them as well. All right, so we'll call them right, x1, x2, x3, right, all the way out to xn. So here I'm just using a subscript to enumerate all of our, our options for x. Right, in some collection of possible right, of possible subjects for a predicate that we're going to define. Right. 
So let's say that we have a quantified variable over some predicate. Assume that p of x is some predicate. Right? For this exercise, we don't need to give it a, an exact definition. Right? Note that this simply logically right, equates to the following. This simply says that p uh, for all x, p of x is logically equivalent to p of x1 and p of x2 and right, all the way out to p of x n. And it's simply a logical conjunction of all of the items right, in our domain, right, the predicate of all of the items in the domain. Right, similarly, we can express our as existential quantifier as a series of disjunctions. So if we had p of x, uh, there exists an x, p of x is logically equivalent to p of x1 or p of x2 or all the way out to p of x n. Thanks. Any questions about that? And right, again, this is a good place to, right, if you're having trouble thinking about or reducing a quantified logical expression, right, these are good identities to keep them in your back pocket, keep in your mind, right, to help you reason about logical statements. Right. Uh, note that, right, we'll do an example in a little bit, but we'll, I'll discuss it now as well. Note that quantifiers have highest precedence, and so, we have a quantifier of five, right? And we have a series of, of predicates and a quantifier right? uh, in front of them. It simply just applies to the first one and it applies immediately unless some sort of scoping or bracket operator or parentheses are used to indicate right, a scope. Right, we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's do a quick example first. Right, so here we have example 1.1. Again, whenever you have a predicate function, always define your domain, right? Otherwise, right, the quantifier has no meaning. It's lost its meaning. And so in this one, let's say that x is an integer. Right, and let's define our predicate p of x right, is x plus x equals x times x. Oops. All right, so here we have a mathematical expression. An equation, right? It is either true or false once we instantiate x. Right. So let's go ahead and look at this. Right. You guys are familiar with the integers, right? These are our, the whole number. Right? And so, if we wanted to quantify this statement, let's say we said for all x, p of x. Right. Is this statement true or false, mathematically speaking? Right, this is false, right? Because this is not this equation does not hold for all integers. Right, there exists an x such so that p of x. Right, this is this is true. Does there an exist an x where this equation holds? <laughs> yes. Right, uh, zero or two. I think. Right, so true. Right. Note, right, if you guys hadn't seen any of these you know, quantifiers and you just saw this mathematical expression, so if right, you guys say that that right, is a true statement, is that a reasonable statement in math in general, right, in any math class that you've taken? That x plus x equals x times x? Yeah. So, <clears throat> let's see. So, if you were in a math class, right, and you were doing some reductions and you wanted to rely on some equality, right, right, and you said that x is equal to x, right, plus 5, right, would you guys say that that is a reasonable statement in mathematics? Right, you guys usually. What I was trying to get across with these examples, but failed miserably apparently, right, is that whenever a quantifier is left off in a statement, such as in, in general mathematics, whenever you guys took your algebra classes or calculus classes and you had some sort of 
uh, equation, right? It's always implied, right, that it's a universal, right, that it's universally quantified with respect to the domain, right? right? So in generally, in mathematics, you would say that this statement is false, right? In general, right? X plus X is not equal to X times X, right? right? And that's because it doesn't always equal that, right? It does in some cases, but not always. Right? But in but in math, right? Whenever you're showing that, whenever the Quantifier is omitted, the universal is always assumed. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. So this is true in any logical, any mathematical statement. Right. Again, X right, has to be defined in terms of its domain, right? In math, the domain is generally the reals or the integers or something of this, of this nature. If you write an equation and you don't specify when it's true, it's assumed that you're stating that it's true for all of the possible values that x can take on. If that's not true, then the equation is false. Any questions about that? And so if the, clear? All right, so when a quantifier is bound to an occurrence of a variable, the variable is said to be bound, right, or applied to an occurrence of a variable, it's said to be bound. Otherwise, the variable is said to be free, right, a bit of nomenclature here. Right? The portion of the logical expression to which a quantifier is applied is referred to the scope of the quantifier. And so let's look at an example where a scope is necessary. And let's say that we have right, the following statement. Oops. And let's say we have there exists an x such that p of x and q of x, right? or for all y, r of y. And so note here we have a, a logical expression, a compound expression where we have three different predicate functions. Right, two of them have a seemingly similar domain, right, and one of them has a possibly different domain. We need to define the domains here. Right? Let's say that x, just generically x, belongs to some domain, and here I'll do a capital X, and y belongs to some domain. Capital Y. So within this scope, right, we're using these brackets here, or sometimes parentheses are used. Right, this indicates that we're quantifying, right, we're applying the existential quantifier right, right, to right, that conjunction. All right, so this is referred to as the scope right, of that quantifier. Oops. Right, so within that scope, x is bound right, to that quantifier. Right. And then here we also have a scope. I'm not going to denote it here, but we could have put parentheses around the R. I'm just indicating that the universal quantifier is being applied to that predicate. Right. If no parentheses are being used, then it's just applied to the immediately adjoining predicate. Yeah, you can have multiple different scopes. If you didn't have a, right, if you, right, you could be bound differently. For example, you could have a for all x, r of x. So you could have the same variable being quantified differently for different predicates. Okay. All right, so you can go ahead and look at the uh, English translation of this. All right, this simply you can read as right there exists an x such that both p of x and q of x. Right, go ahead and write that out.
right? And then I'll put a semicolon here. Going from English to logic, and logic to English is sometimes tedious. The English language is very ambiguous and unclear. And so you'll see whenever I try to speak in English, especially in homework questions or test questions or something like that, I'll use things like parentheses and semicolons to try to clearly indicate it's like the grouping and the application of ands and ors because in English it's unclear right? when you say this and this or this and this and this or this and this, it's unclear what it is I want you to do first in that statement. Right? So I will help you out. Similarly, I will do this here. So this is just an example where I'm putting a semicolon there saying you know, use this conjunction first, do the logical and first. Right? So semicolon and then or right for all y p of y i'm sorry that's an r and r of y good example of translation there again it's difficult especially when you're talking about quantifiers in english for all for each sum, right? At least one, right? You have to think of the English mapping to these two quantifiers and, and back and forth from the quantifiers to uh, English. All right. Next, we'll talk about De Morgan's law for quantifiers, and then we'll take a quick break. Right. So De Morgan's law comes up yet again. You know, this is going to happen in the next few weeks as well. Right, so here we have De Morgan's law, right, with respect to the quantifiers, right. Note that, right, we have the following logical equivalences. And similarly, we have I note that this is simply a direct result of the logical definition of these quantifiers. Right? Previously, we denoted that the universal quantifier applied to a predicate function is simply equal to the conjunction of that predicate function applied to all of the items in its domain. Right? And that the as existential quantifier applied to a predicate is simply a disjunction of that predicate applied to all of the items in the domain. Right. You have a homework question we are, where you are asked to prove these logical equivalences right, in assignment number two. You will, of course, want to use that fact, right, substitute that fact in, apply to Morgan's law, and you're done. Right. This simply follows from De Morgan's law as we learned it in propositional logic. All right, so let's go ahead and do our break now. When we come back, we'll do an example right, of translating and adding some intuition to De Morgan's Law and quantifiers.
All right, guys, let's pick up where we left off. And so we're getting ready to start example uh, 117. And it's just a brief investigation of De Morgan's Law and the translation to English and our understanding of English to help provide some intuition to De Morgan's Law. Again, you're going to more formally prove De Morgan's Law right, as applied to quantifiers in your homework. And in this example, let's assume that the domain of X is all Hoyas. Okay, so x can be any Hoya. And our predicate function, p of x, is simply defined to be that x is fantastic. Again, we'll go back to the triple bar definition. Right. So our quantified statement for all x, p of x, we can translate that to English by saying what? How would you translate that to English? Yeah. All Hoyas are fantastic. That is a great translation. Right. The next statement is not for all x, p of x. Right. How would you translate that to English? Anyone want to give that a go? I think that's a reasonable English sentence. Right? Some people might extend it to say it's not the case that all players are fantastic, but not all players are fantastic. I think it's pretty straightforward, and semantically speaking. Right. And so, how about our third statement here? There exists an x such that not p of x. How would you translate this to English? If you had to directly translate it to English, yeah. And so a direct translation might be, right, there is at least, right, there exists one Hoya who is not fantastic. As you pointed out, right, the second and third statements, semantically similar. Right. Again, providing some intuition as to why the Morgan's Law, right, uh, as we stated, right, is logically true. And again, you guys will more formally prove that in your homeworks. And any questions about the translation? You guys will have some homework questions where you're asked to do some translations. And again, the translations can be a, trick, be a bit tricky. If you have a lot of conjunctions and disjunctions, feel free to put parentheses in your English translation. Make it clear. All right, lastly, it's important to note, and sort of wrapping up our discussion of quantifiers, right, we can have nested quantifiers, thus providing for fairly complicated logical statements. Right, a nested quantifier right, is simply the case or a scenario where we have two quantifiers, where one is within the scope of the other. Right. So what do we mean by that? Let's look at an example. And this would be example 1.18. And here, let's say that we have domains. And let's say that X's domain will be the reals. And Y's domain will be the reals. Right. And let's define P of X, Y. to be that x plus y equals zero. 
And again, we have two entities or two subjects in this particular statement. Right? And the predicate is simply that their sum is equal to zero. All right, let's investigate a nested quantifier here. So here, let's say that we have And for all x, there exists a y, so p of x, y. All right, the English translation of this. For each x, right, there exists a y, right, such that p of x, y. Right, there's a few ways you can apply some intuition to this. Now, number one, I think a, a common analogy here is to think of embedded for loops with some sort of logical condition checked within the innermost loop. Right here, the outermost loop would be looping over all the values of x. The innermost loop would be looping over all the values of y. Right? And then inside, you'd be checking to see whether p of x, y is true. If you have a for all quantifier, right, you would be doing a conjunction at the end of each one of those iterations of that logical statement. Right? If you have an exists, you'd be doing a disjunction at the end of uh, each iteration of that particular loop. Right. And then you would aggregate that truth of disjunctions and conjunctions, and you would get a truth value at the end. Right. So this would either be true or false. I mentioned this analogy first because you guys have some programming under your belt, so maybe that's a really good and intuitive way to think about this. Right. Another really good and intuitive way to think about this is simply to right, apply these operators in order and expand out by translating the existential quantifier to simply a series of disjunctions and the universal quantifier as a series of conjunctions. Right, and so we'll go ahead and do that now. Right, so in this example, we're going to just expand this nested quantifier. Right? I've left a lot of drawing space here. You guys should do the same. Right? It could be pretty big. Let's list out our domain here. So let's say that the domain of X has M elements and are in possibilities. Let's say that the domain of Y has N possibilities. Let's, what is the logical statement for all x, there exists a y, right, of p of x, y. Right, what does this mean? Right, again, we can apply these in sequence, so right, the as existential operator is applied first, right, then the universal quantifier is applied first. Right, so this is logically equivalent to what? Our definition of the as existential operator or our log logical equivalence that we've, that we've uh, shown right, simply says that this is a disjunction of all of the items in Y's domain. Right, so we can take a disjunction. Right, that is, this is logically equivalent to for all X. And then apply the existential operator. Right, P of X comma Y1 or P of X comma Y2 or p of x comma y n. And again, all we've done, right, there exists a y, simply means that at least one, this predicate is going to hold for at least one of the y's. And so that's simply a disjunction over all the possible y's. I said that in our domain of y's, we have n options, so I've just enumerated them out. Good so far? And similarly, we can now apply the universal quantifier. The universal quantifier is simply going to enumerate out right, this entire expression n times. So we're going to get this row repeated n times. Again, just like a double quotient, we're like traversing a square or a grid or a table. Right. We're going to get a grid or a table of predicates with all combinations of x's and y's. Right. We're combining all of those predicate values, those truth values, using conjunctions and disjunctions based on whether we have an edge extension quantifier or a universal quantifier and the order there. 
so here, let's go ahead and do the first row, and we'll make that x1. And so here we'll simply have p of x1 comma y1 or p of x1 comma y2 or dot 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 p of x1 comma yn. Right, so that's all of our x1s. Right, so again, we we can be filling this out for all of the x1s. Right, and now we need to have a conjunction right, for all. This statement needs to be true for all of the x's. So this simply says that it's true for x1. We want it to be true for all of the x's. Right, so we need to have a conjunction of this and right, that entire series of disjunctions for x2. And so p of x2, y1, or p of x2, y2, or p of x2, yn. Note that this is a conjunction, right? This statement has to be true for x1, it has to be true for x2, right? It will always be true for all x. I think that since the as extensive quantifier is the innermost test of quantifier, you have we're gonna have this huge grid here, all the disjunctions are gonna be on the inside of the grid, and all the conjunctions are gonna be combined into the rows of x3, logically speaking. Again, we'll repeat this out. We'll have a row for x3, a row for x4, a row for x5, all the way down to the last row of x. X has m elements, and so our last row will simply be p of x m y1 or p of x2, y2, or p, I'm sorry, xm, p of xm, ym. All right. But let's reduce our domain here and think of this simply. So let's, rather than just doing this example over all the reals, right, let's think about this particular example over a smaller set. Let's say, let's say x and y right, are, let's say, positive, let's say, p of, let's say x is 1, 2, 3, and y is, let's say, uh, minus one, three, four. And is our proposition gonna hold where we're summing, right, the sum of each of these values is equal to zero? Does everyone understand? I've restricted the domain so that we can fill this out in our grid a little bit more easily. Each domain is of size three. X has three possibilities. It could be one, two, or three. Right? And Y can be minus one, three, or four. Right? Is the statement for all X, there exists a Y, P of X, Y, can be true or not? Right? Let's, go, let's go row by row. Right? In this first row, we have X1, excuse me, down here, X1 and Y1. Right? Is the predicate true for that statement? Yes. Okay. Do we need to see whether it's true of the rest of those statements in that row? That's all just jumped up. That whole row is true. Okay. Then we can move on to the next row. Okay. The next row asks if x2 uh, is the predicate true for x2 and y1. Is that true? No. Is it true for x2 and y2? Okay. The second item in x? Nope. And the second item in y? Nope. Is it true for the last? x2 and y3, no. All right, so that row is false. And we have a conjunction with false. We don't need to continue evaluating this for the rest of the rows because there exists an x, right? So there exists a y, or, or where there are no y, it's not that it's true. And so that row is zero, that row is false. Right? So the whole thing is going to be false. Some sense? And I encourage you to practice a few of these, right? Uh, as the nesting, right, will be tricky if you don't keep your uh, 
the order of the, the nesting organized. Can you test it if there's a predicate Yes. Okay. So we're using the predicate from the previous definition. Okay. That was just for a further example. Just in the general case, though, this is the logical and this statement is logically equivalent to this statement here. Right. You can expand out your universal and existential quantifiers into a series of disjunctions and conjunctions. Right. Again, you guys are you have a homework question where you're asked right, to rely upon this property. So let's look at the English interpretation of these nested quantifiers. Again, we've already given you the exact justification, right? Or at least I've given you intuition as to how to derive the exact logical equivalence of these quantified statements and nested quantified statements. Right. Uh, here's the English translation. Again, the English translation can be a bit ambiguous because it's English. Right. You already know, know the formal definition. You should always rely on that. Right. If you have a for all x and for all y, note that if it's if they're both universal, the order is not going to matter. Why? Because we're going to build out that table right, of all the possible combinations of x and y, and we're going to have conjunctions on the inside, conjunctions on the outside. So conjunctions between each proposition in each row. Right, and then we're going to have conjunctions combining the results in each row. And so it's just a whole bunch of conjunctions. Right? And so the order doesn't matter. Right? So if we have a for all x there exists a y, right, order is going to matter because we're going to have on each row, we're going to have disjunctions. Right? And then combining each of the rows, we're going to have conjunctions. And that's not logically the same as having conjunctions and then logically combining those disjunctions with the row below in our table. Right, so if we have a for all x there exists a y, this is going to use that for every x, there is at least one y for which p of x, y is true. Right. There exists an x for all y to state that there, there is an x right, for which p of x, y is true for every y. Right. Again, logically speaking, when you expand this out, this means we're going to have conjunctions right, across the row and disjunctions combining each row. Right. Similarly, with our uh, universal, if we have both it's essentially quantified. This means that we're combining all the predicates with disjunctions across the row and disjunctions combining the row. So it's just all disjunctions, right? So the order does not matter in that case either. But in the general case, order matters. If you have a for all, right, a universal followed by an existential or an existential followed by a universal. All right, let's look at an example of this where order matters. Let's say that the domain of x, y, and z is the reals and right, let's define our predicate p of x, y, and z. Oops is the statement x plus y equals z. And now let's look at quantifying these variables and assessing the truth of these statements. We have for all x, let's try for all y, and there exists a z. And such that p of x, y, z. So for all x, for all y, right? So for all combinations of x and y, there's going to exist a z right, such that the statement is true. Not everyone here is like necessarily a, a number theory person or anything like this, but uh, do you guys think that's a true statement? It's infeasible. Yeah. So for all possible x and y, there's at least one z that would make that equivalence hold. Again, if you wanted to provide some more intuition, you could string this out into a table. Right? You would make a three-dimensional table, but you could do that. And at this point, we can also investigate, let's say there exists right, uh, an x for all y, and there exists a z 
such that P of X, Y, and Z right, is this true? Well, intuitively, yeah, it's, it can be true. Why? Because they're true for all x, so and less than that. It can be true for at least one x. So you know, we can't be true for all x. It can be true for at least one of them, yeah. Right, so this is true. Now let's go ahead and mix this up a bit. Let's say that we want to know, is this going to be true that there exists a z? Right, such that for all x right, and for all y, and p of x, y, right, is this going to be true? That is, there exists a y such that this equality, or there exists a z such that this equality for all combinations of x and y. Right, so there isn't a number right, that is equal to the sum of all combinations of all possible other numbers. Right? Okay. So that is not true. And this is false. Yes? Is there a difference between that one and this one? Sure. And so uh, here, the, again, the order of the matter. So here we have a, uh, a table where we have a conjunction. Or it gives you a disjunction over all z's and all possible combinations of x and y, or conjunctions across x and y. Right, so this means for all possible pairs of x and y, okay, they can exist in z, right, uh, such that that goes. Does that make sense? Right. And here we have right, a disjunction over the z's, right, followed by conjunctions over x's and y's. Okay. So that means that. In this in a huge table or uh, a multi dimensional table, here, right, that there is going to be uh, a row of z's, right, where a row of z's, right, or one, at least one z, where this is going to hold for all possible combinations of x and y. And so, again, order matters right, in this. Um, again, if you have trouble wrapping your mind around how order matters here, I encourage you to go through the homework. Expand these out into their logical disjunctions and conjunctions right, until right, until it, you have that aha moment. Right. Let's do one more example here of translation to English. And then we can jump into our rules of inference. Let's go ahead and do that. So in this particular example, let's say that uh, if a person is female and is a parent, right, then that person is someone's mother. Does that seem like a reasonable statement to try to translate to logic? All right, let's try that. And so if a person is a female, and is a parent and then let's say that person is someone's mother and we're going from Predicate statements and predicate logic to English isn't isn't too bad though. Again, um, going to English can be tough because English is ambiguous. Going from English to predicate logic is a little bit more tougher because number one, you need to parse through the statement, which has multiple subjects, multiple predicates, and then potentially some of the subjects or some of the predicates are being quantified with respect to some domain. So then you also need to identify a domain. Right. So I think uh, as a good exercise, I think. You guys should break into groups of two or three or you know, meet your neighbor again. Right? Try to break this down into a logical statement. That is, identify the predicates, assign or define domains for these predicates, right? and then write these out. Right? Identify if the predicates are being quantified with respect to their domain. 
right? and then write this out as a logical expression. Right? Again, it's a good exercise. It's, just, it's harder than you, you think the first time right? if you haven't practiced. And, uh, so go ahead and give that a go, and we'll compare notes in five or ten minutes. It's also important to note there may be multiple solutions. There's not necessarily a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. So how many of you have a, have one, exactly one predicate function for this entire statement? How many of you have done this with two predicate functions, exactly two? How many of you are thinking you're going to need three? If you think you have a good solution, feel free to raise your hand and we can investigate. Thank you. 
Do you want to go ahead and share it with us? How do you translate 